Good morning. Oh, can you got to be more alive than that? Good morning. All right. Well, I'm glad you're here with us today. And, you know, uh, I don't know what you did over your spring break. Uh, spring break for me was a week to sleep in. I don't know if anybody can agree with that or testify to that. Uh, when Monday's alarm clock went off at a very ungodly hour of 545 in the morning so I can get up here and work out in the, in the fitness center, I honestly felt like saying words that professors and pastors should never say. Um, I held my tongue. And uh, I persevered and made it here. But for, for me, spring break was supposed to be a week to go to the beach with my family and, and do fun things. And then the weather didn't want to cooperate. I don't know if you had any experiences with foul weather. So for me, it was a week of, of sleeping in and catching up on movies. And so I'm not sure what your family does for fun. We like to watch movies. Um, one of the movies that my youngest son, Funda, we adopted him five years ago from South Africa. Um, one of the movies that he's been wanting to see for a long time, but we've been putting off is the latest movie of Annie. I'm not sure if you saw that fun song and dance show. Um, but we watched Annie together, and um, it was kind of fun to kind of see these, these young uh, foster kids kind of singing about the hard knocks of life. And, and it made me kind of think about when coming back to school after spring break. It's kind of that season when you, you know the end is coming, but it's still so far away. You know, it's like there's six weeks and there's nothing in between now and, and finals to kind of give you that relief or that reprieve. It's kind of like it's just coming and it's just this onslaught of tests and projects that you're already dreading and probably studying for right now as I speak. And the reality is that that's the way life is. I remember when I graduated from Bible college a very long time ago, I said to myself, I will never go back to school. I am done with school, and I just swore off I would never go to seminary. And three years later, one of my mentors said, Dave, you really need to go to seminary. It would, it would help you out. And, and so um, I relented. I went back and got my master's. And as soon as I was done with my master's, um, I got my master's at Talbot. I said, I am never going back to school again. I am done forever in a day. And, and then Biola called and said, hey, you know, we'd love to have you as a professor, but you have to get your PhD. And I was like, oh. So the good news, I just finished my doctorate, and uh, they call it your terminal degree because it's like the last degree you can get, and so thank God there is no more school that I have to go to. But I also think they call it your terminal degree because it, it kills you, all right? It makes you, it's like a terminal illness that, that you have to just kind of suffer through. Is there a way to get this PowerPoint on the screen on my, from my computer? Oh, you're beautiful, thank you. And, and so one of the things that's been amazing to me is as I was struggling through my PhD, people would say, Dave, how are you doing with it? And I literally would say these words, it is sucking my will to live, all right? And it was one of these kind of things that I felt like I just had to slay the beast and move on. And yet I recognize that, um, Movies like Annie remind me that there's people that have it a lot harder than I do. And every time I look at my son, Fundo, and recognize uh, the world that he came from, I recognize people have it a lot harder than I do. And the hard knocks that sometimes we could sing about and dance about and, and kind of laugh about because it's with the hardest we know at this moment, you never know what life is going to be bringing to you next and what other people are dealing with right now. And I want to talk about when the going gets tough with you. I want to talk about how we really persevere and, and, and kind of make it through the suffering and the hardships because the reality is that suffering and hardships do a variety of things in people. For some people, it's the reason to walk away from God. One of my therapies that I, I, I pr practice in is I'm the chaplain for the Orange County Fire Department. I get to live out my boyhood dream of riding on fire trucks. I mean, that literally is why I do what I do with them. But part of my role of being a chaplain is entering into people's worst days. I mean, people don't call 911 because they're happy and they know it. It's like they don't call 911 because they just want to share their joy with someone else. They call 911 in a moment of crisis, in a moment of emergency. And, and so it's, been a, it's amazing when I ride out with these guys and I walk in um, with one of the fire crews and they see that they brought a chaplain with them. They immediately think the worst, like, am I dying? You know, and, and, they, and they, they might feel that way. And other people, time, other times they call me because someone really has experienced the worst and they have died and I walk into these moments of hardship and some people look at me and they question who God is because they see the crosses on my uniform and they say if there's a God then why would he allow and they would just name whatever crisis or hardship they've just suffered through if God is real if God is loving why am I experiencing this hard time 
Now, I've experienced some hardships in life, and I've never been tempted to walk completely away from God, but maybe you're more like me because I have used hardships in my life to rationalize my sin to God. To say, you know what, God, if, if this is what life is going to be, well then, it's okay if I do these things on the side to kind of get me through the moment. And I've used these rationalizations that kind of take me away from what God really has for me. And I think part of my problem, why I've rationalized these, you know, these behaviors in the midst of hardships and suffering is because my expectation is that if I'm a Christian, if I'm following Jesus Christ, if God loves me, then my expectation is I shouldn't have hardship. I shouldn't have suffering. And yet, Scripture paints such a different picture. And that's why this morning I want to look with you in the brief time I have with you at 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you brought a Bible with you, I really want to encourage you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. And we're just going to look at Peter's introduction. We're just going to look at the beginning of, of what he's written here because what we're looking at here is a short letter that is full of doctrine and it has a lot to say about the Christian life and persecution and suffering and hope. And Peter, I think, really is one as he kind of introduces himself in the very beginning of 1 Peter 1 when he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's really giving his credentials that I've seen Jesus, I've walked with Jesus, I've, I've heard him speak and, do, and I've watched his miracles. And yet Peter really, I think, is a great um, example because he's no stranger to conflict in hard times. So when he's going to speak to these churches and these followers of Christ who have been scattered throughout Asia Minor, Minor he's, he's really speaking as one who's experienced the highs and the lows. I mean, all you have to do is look back to Matthew 14 when you have this experience of, of Jesus um, coming out to the disciples, and they've been rowing at their boat for hours, and they're tired. And these are, these are boat people. They know how to row a boat. They know what they should be able to do, but they're being buffeted by the wind and the waves, it says. And then in the middle of that night, Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And at first they get scared and they think it's the demon that kind of controls the, the wind and the waves over the lake. But when they see it's Jesus, Peter speaks up. He's the only one that has the faith to say something. Everybody else, the other 11 were boat huggers. Peter had enough faith to say, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you. I love that he didn't say, hey, let me walk on water too. He said, hey, tell me to come be with you. And, and he goes out and he walks on the water and he does this amazing miracle, one that you and I have tried to reproduce, all right? Admit it to yourself. You have tried to walk on water. At some pool party, you have said, how many steps can I take? I know you've tried it, all right? And you probably have taken a half a step and then you've fallen in. Peter got farther. Peter actually started walking on the water, but then it says he saw the wind and the waves and he started to fear. Great moments with God, and then these, these hardships, these failures. He had the ability to kind of recognize Jesus was the Messiah, but then at the same time, he rebuked Jesus and says, no, no, you're not going to be the Messiah that, that has always been intended. You're going to be the Messiah that I want you to be. Later on, he, he defends Jesus in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, even chopping off a guy's ear. But then later on, when a little girl kind of confronts him about his relationship with Jesus, he denies his relationship completely. And so if there's anyone that could teach the message about how to endure hardships, I really think it's Peter because he's been through the ups and the downs. He's been arrested and released from prison. And so he introduces himself as Peter, verse 1, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout, and then he lists a number of cities throughout Asia Minor. I want to briefly look back at the identity of who he's writing to. He first of all calls them God's elect. God's chosen. This has always been kind of a special term that God has used throughout scriptures to refer to those he loves. He selected Israel. He calls the church to himself. And, and the reality, he kind of just right away identifies these people who are going through hard times, who are experiencing persecution. We'll look at that in a little bit. He wants to bring them the comfort to say, you know what, I know what you're going through, but God has not forgotten you. You're still God's chosen ones. You're the ones that God knew ahead of time and selected and called to himself. You know, one of the, the things that as you're growing up, your identities of who you kind of, kind of associate with greatly changed. 
You know, when you're in high school, you might have had a number of different friend groups, and you come to college, and it's kind of changes, and some of the sh- friends you thought were so solid kind of kind of leave, and, and new ones were, um, come together, and there's highs, there's lows. Then you, you might graduate, you might get married, and you have new identities and new relationships, and, and that's been a, a struggle for me as I've had these seasons of who, who am I friends with, who am I identified with. But I remember when I was growing up, my dad was one of those kind of guys that was Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you can identify with Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. My dad literally was a rocket scientist. He worked for NASA. The Mars orbiter that's still going around Mars, he designed that thing. And, 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 but in high school, he literally could not dress himself accordingly, all right? And so it was embarrassing to like have your dad come to things because he was the one standing out with the pocket protector and the pins, the heavy eyeglasses, the, you know, and you're just like, yeah, that's my dad. My dad passed away about seven years ago. And it was only after he passed away that I started to recognize all that he was. Now, we had to develop a relationship um, years before that, and it got much better once we were able to tell him how to dress himself in public. But the reality is that that identity that I belonged to him was something I was so proud about speaking of after his passing. And I wish I would have clung on to that identity when he was alive more. And what Peter is reminding these people, remember who you belong to. Remember your identity. It doesn't start with you. It starts with the fact that God has chosen you. Now, he does recognize you're strangers in this world. In other words, he's recognizing you're exiles. You don't belong here. You kind of are, are, are people that are not fitting in like most people would want to fit in. And he even goes on to talk about the persecution they've experienced because they've been scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and, and Cappadocia and Asia and, and uh, Bithynia. These are places in Asia Minor or Turkey, modern day Turkey, and they've been scattered, if you look at the book of Acts, not because they wanted to go on vacation or not because they got a new job, but they got scattered because they got kicked out of Jerusalem and because of persecution, they were escaping to these other areas. And so he's talking to people who are going through difficult times, going through hardships, and he says, look, I'm talking to you. And then look at verse two. I love what he's saying. I'm speaking to you, God's chosen, the ones who are going through difficult times, Who? Okay, it's another identity term. Another way to say, look of who you are is now gonna be rooted in what God has done for you. Look at what he says in verse two. He has this overview of the saving work of the triune God when he says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. In other words, we see right here this sovereign work, this sanctifying work, this amazing redeeming work that, the, that our triune God has done for us. And so our, our identity isn't just rooted in it. Yeah, I'm on God's team. My identity is rooted in my salvation. And that's what I want you to catch tonight. Or sorry, this morning. I forget where I'm at. The reality is this. When the going gets tough, what keeps us focused is rejoicing in our salvation. And we're going to look at five reasons why we can rejoice when the going gets tough. And I want to say this is something I think Biola students need to hear more than others. Because as a pastor, last, you know, two Sundays ago when it was Easter, we had, you know, double the number of people that we normally have on a Sunday. We normally have somewhere around 800 adults that attend our church on a Sunday. <clears throat> we had over 1,600 people that one day. A lot of people came just because it was Easter. A lot of people came more regularly just because it was Easter. And there's some people that for them, hearing the story of of the resurrection is a new idea. But for you, you've heard it too much. You become blasé with this. You get inoculated. It's like, yeah, I've heard this story since I was young. Yeah, Jesus loves me. Yeah, Jesus arose from the dead. And we fail to recognize the depth and the, and the joy that is resting in our salvation that kind of is the what is to get us through these difficult times. And so he starts off looking now in verse three. He says, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through his resurrection, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me just push pause right there. It's God's mercy that gives us this new hope, 
this living hope, this eternal hope, this idea that, you know what, this world is not all there is, that death is not the end of the story. And what he's trying to say to these people is, and you're going through these difficult times, it's so great that because God had mercy on us, he didn't give us what we deserve, but instead he gives us living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if we have gotten so blasé about the story of the resurrection, then we need to go deeper in appreciating the work of Christ on the cross and what the resurrection gives us that this world isn't all that there is. See, I can recognize that if this life is all that is, I have to look forward to, then yes, suffering and hardship would be the greatest thing to fear. If this world and my struggles were my ultimate reality, then I would truly be depressed. But because the resurrection proves there's something greater than death, there's something more than to look forward to, then I have this living hope. This, not this hope that's kind of like, oh, wishful thinking, but it's this kind of this welling up within me. And it all becomes because of how God looked at me. And because of this idea of this living hope, I have an inheritance. Look at verse 4. It says, and into, it's a continuing sentence now, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Let me push pause again right there. Here's what you have to look forward to. Now, some of you have parents that have planned well and life has been blessing them, and so you're thinking about an inheritance. Some of you have, have parents that God is just getting them through the moment, and so your inheritance that you might receive from them is, is really nothing. And, and so you're not really looking forward to that. But the reality is you have a heavenly father who has something that he's saving for you, something that will never perish. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be taken away from you. It will never spoil. It's not going to be polluted or defiled. It won't fade. It won't decay or be subject to loss. And it's kept in heaven awaiting us. So in other words, as we're going through this difficult time, my focus is not on the moment and on myself. My focus is on what God has in store for me, what I have to look forward to. All because, look at verse 5, all because of God's power. Verse 5, it continues the sentence. Who through faith, this is remember what you are going to receive and what you, who you are and receiving. Um, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. See, this idea of God's power, this, this inheritance that we have to look forward to, this salvation that we have is guarded, it's assured, it's guaranteed, but it has this idea of not yet. It's now and still coming. It's that future sense of salvation that my eternal life with God starts right now. And we have to recognize that, that what Christ has called us to with eternal life begins right here, right now, in a past relationship with him, but it continues on for all eternity. And there's things that I have not yet experienced that God has for me that's awaiting for me in heaven because of who God is and his power. And so when the going gets tough, I can rejoice in my salvation. That's what I focus on. It's not when the going gets tough, the tough get going. It's not when the going gets tough, I'm gonna to pick myself up and be self-determined. I'm gonna try harder. It's when the going gets tough, I'm gonna remember what's ultimate, what's most important, what I have to look forward to. See, I think what's getting some of you through the difficulty of finishing this semester is you're looking forward to graduation. And you know that in six weeks, you're walking across the stage and it's, you're gonna be done with homework for us for a season or forever. And you're gonna recognize, man, I got something exciting ahead of me. I'm looking forward to that. For those of you, it's, it's summer vacation and you got some great plans that you're going on. You know, for me, what, what I'm looking forward to after this semester and after summer school, I can take my family to Hawaii for two weeks. And I, we're, we've been talking about Hawaii and dreaming about what we're gonna do and, and talking about the places we've gone before and the meals we're gonna eat. And that, that kind of looking forward to something kind of gives us the energy to kind of persevere through this time. But the greatest thing we have to look forward to is what our salvation will ultimately be for us. Now, Peter keeps talking, though, about reasons we can rejoice when the going gets tough. When he starts now um, in, in verse 7, well, let me kind of go back to uh, verse 6. Um, he kind of finishes the thought. In this you greatly rejoice, though for now, no, now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, See, Peter's wanting to remember, yes, you have had it hard. You have that to look forward to, but you have had it hard. But look what he says next. He says, here's the purpose for this. Verse 7, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
part of the reason God allows us to go through hardships is so that our faith in him is proved genuine to that refining of the fire. I, I mentioned briefly from the beginning that we adopted uh, a little boy five years ago from South Africa, and my wife and I and our family have had a long relationship um, with orphan care in South Africa. And a number of years ago, uh, we took our family to Johannesburg for a, a long season to kind of do some relief house parenting um, at one of the orphanages that we were working with. And on one of the days, we took our own kids, and I have a daughter who's 21 who's here as a student. I have a son that's 17 as well. This is before we adopted Fundo, who's now seven. Um, we took him to this amusement park. It's the Disneyland of South Africa. And what they basically have done in Johannesburg is they've taken an old gold mine and they've converted it into an amusement park where they have rides and, and like characters that are walking around. And so we went there and it's like, you know, a county fair, um, but down a few notches, okay? But it was still like the amusement park of South Africa. And one of the attractions was you could go down into the mine shaft where they still had gold veins running through the, the walls. And so we, we did that. We kind of got in this rickety elevator and we went a couple hundred feet below the surface and we're walking through these tunnels uh, of where the gold was being mined. And I kept thinking to myself, what am I doing here? I'm 200 feet underground in a rickety old gold mine. Why am I here? But one of the cool things is you kind of see the gold veins and then as you got out, they took you to where they kind of refined the gold and there was this extremely hot kiln where they had melted down the gold and, and poured it into these bar shapes and you could kind of see the gold being formed. And gold in our standard today and back in Peter's day was one of the greatest values. We, we measure our worth by how much gold someone actually has. And Peter is saying that, you know what? A genuine faith, not this emotional whim that you might go through, but this genuine faith that is refined by fire is much more valuable than gold. And what he's trying to say is sometimes we only know where our faith lies when we go through these testings to kind of show us here's where we're at. And so we have to say, you know what, just like metal is strengthened through the fire, just like we kind of reveal what's real by the fire, our faith is proved genuine by what we go through. And it's that thing that we hold on to. Because it's not just about, hey, look what I was able to do. It is, look what I'm able to do for Jesus. See, when the going gets tough, I want you to remember, we rejoice in our Savior who's with us. He will be revealed. Look what it says in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you have not seen him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We don't have the proof that Peter had of who Jesus is and what he accomplished. But through the witnesses of scripture and the experiences with the Holy Spirit today, we know him and we love him and rejoice in him. And so when the going is tough, we look forward to what our salvation will be because of who our Savior is. And we hold on to that and we celebrate that because ultimately, here's the fifth reason, verse nine, uh, verse nine, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. In other words, we have something to look forward to that we're gonna receive what was promised us because of who Jesus Christ is. And so we, when the going is tough, we're gonna to rejoice in our Savior. So going forward, I wanna give you a couple of challenges or invites to kind of think about. And the first one is this, don't let the tough times consume you or distract you. Um, I, I tend to do this. I tend to have this worrisome mind as a dad, as a husband, as a youth pastor, as a professor, and I can play this what if game. That like if this happens, then this could happen. And if that happens, then that could happen. And so in my mind, I can make a situation 10 times worse than it actually is. I don't know if you can identify with that sense of worry. Um, I have that problem. I have to confess it to God all the time. And one of the things I've had to practice is to not... Um, let that consume me or distract me, but instead through solitude and prayer, to say, God, I'm giving you room to deal with that. See, even the injustice that you might experience in life, in Romans chapter 12, it says, leave room for God's wrath. You have a loving Heavenly Father who is more upset about what you're going through than you are if it's through injustice that has been caused to you. And so we need to leave room for God to deal with it. And so don't allow your bitterness, don't allow the disappointment that you're experiencing hardships, don't allow that unmet, unrealistic expectation that you should have it easy to distract you from all that God's called you to be and all that God's called you to, to do in following after him. 
And the way we do that, I found, is that I need to continue to remind myself of why God is worth celebrating. And part of the difficulty of coming to a place like Bible, as great as it is, is that the Bible has become your textbook. And reading the Bible has become your homework. And it stopped being a love letter that God gave you a long time ago just so that you would get to know him and fall in love with him and celebrate him. And so I want to encourage you to not just read your Bible, not just kind of have this plan of, of i got to do this just because someone told me I have to check this box off, but actually try to spend time with God each day just saying, God, I wanted to get to know you better so I can celebrate who you are and what you have in store for me. You know, if I treated my wife like a project— If I only kind of hung out with her and saw her when I needed to, we would not have much of a marriage. But I've learned, you know, my wife and I just celebrated 23 23 years of marriage this last weekend. And I've learned over 23 years that every day I have to spend some time with her. There's actually a study out there, and I've quoted this to my wife, but I wish I could actually find the study so I could print it out and give it to her. But I heard it said that married couples need to have 30 seconds of kissing every day. It doesn't sound like a lot, But I can tell you as a married guy, 30 seconds of kissing allows for a lot more things to happen later. And so I tell her that all the time. I need to have 30 seconds just kissing you. And and the reality for her is if if she's going to kiss me for 30 seconds, we have to have a whole lot more time talking each day. Because she's not just going to go right for the kiss. And so we have to do the same thing with God. There has to be these moments every day. Say, God, I need to be with you. And and I need to know who you are so that my thoughts are more about you and not about my worries and my problems. And I can remind myself by just kind of spending time each day just kind of knowing you um, in, in your word, kind of what you have in store for me. Now, every day my wife and I get together and, and have some time, but we have found that we also need to have date nights. Not just letting life take place, but for 23 years, we have made it a point that every week we get dressed up, we go out, we hold hands, we do something fun, we're just focused on each other. And you do the same thing with God. You need to spend at least once a week with God's people getting dressed up and focused on him. A lot of times we call it church. And there's a pastor there who's teaching you God's word that you might know God more. And so that, but here, don't neglect that deeper time with God on a weekly basis. This is a great, amazing place. And, and Bible has given you opportunities like chapel and other retreats to go deep with him. But you got to start developing habits now that will continue after Biola. See, when you graduate, you won't have a dorm full of other people that will hold you accountable. When you graduate, you won't have chapels a couple times a week, but you will have the church. You'll have a body of people that will love you and know you and will encourage you, and so you can go deeper with God. And then lastly, I just want to encourage you to continue to rejoice to rejoice, to celebrate, to find ways to say, God, you are good, and so I'm going to just sing, I'm going to dance, I'm going to celebrate who you are as I get to know who you are. I heard a story about a, a shipwreck survivor. He was the only one that survived the shipwreck, and he was washed up on a small, uninhabited island. And he prayed furiously, furiously for God to rescue him. Every day he scanned the horizon for help, but for a number of days, nothing was coming. And exhausted, he finally managed to build himself a little hut of driftwood because he figured, all right, I'm going to be here for a while. And so he he built this hut of driftwood, and he he started gathering supplies around the island that he could could sort of live with, and he scoured the the sand for things that had washed ashore that he could kind of have a few possessions. And after, you know, doing this for a while, he went out one day to scavenge for food. But when he, he was coming back, he saw in the distance some smoke. And he arrived to his hut to find it up in flames. The worst had happened in his mind. He had lost everything, and he was so angry. He just yelled at it, God, how could you do this to me? And he just sat down on the the sand and kind of wept himself to sleep. And early the next day, he was awakened by the sound of a ship that was approaching the island. It had come to rescue him. And when the the rescuers were there in the boat, the, the weary man just said, how did you know I was here? They said, well, we saw your smoke signal. See, sometimes the things that we think are the worst, we think the things that God has let happen because he doesn't care, even in the midst of pain and suffering, those really are truly God's acts of love to help us get to where he knows we need to be because he's chosen us, but he wants to reveal what our faith really can be in him. So when our going is tough, let's celebrate and rejoice in our Savior who gives us our salvation. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.